Welcome to the 2020 Public Health Law Virtual Summit. We have two presentations in this session and each presentation will be followed by a Q&A. Use the chat feature to submit your question. If you encounter technical difficulties, go to the navigation menu and select Need Help. Now, I'll turn it over to our first speaker. Share my screen, apologies. Hello, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's a true pleasure to speak with you today about this important topic. Uh, many thanks to the Network for Public Health Law for hosting this important discussion. Uh, this presentation explores how states have acted through legislative, regulatory, and executive actions to leverage telehealth in the COVID-19 response. As you will see, this is a broad area of law that is changing rapidly. I cannot possibly cover all changes in only 20 minutes, but I will try to give you an idea of the types of legal changes we are seeing nationwide. Uh, just a disclaimer, uh, I taught a three hour class immediately pre, uh, prior to this presentation, um, and I've got a newborn who's keeping me up at night, so hopefully you won't see me completely unravel in the next 20 minutes here. For those of you that are interested, here are the methods for our findings. Uh, I'm not gonna go over this in any detail, but I do wanna note one thing. These authorities were collected in May and June of 2020. This is an area of rapid legal development, and so I expect that there have been some developments since this time. Let's start by defining telehealth. Broadly speaking, telehealth is the use of technology to support long distance clinical health care, where healthcare provider and patient are in different physical locations. Today, uh, I will use the term telehealth broadly, uh, but you should know that states and the federal government do not have consistent terminology and the definitions uh, for telehealth can vary even within a, a single jurisdiction. Telehealth is broadly promoted as a healthcare access tool by connecting patients with distant providers. Uh, telehealth is particularly useful in rural and healthcare shortage areas, as well as useful to patients with transportation difficulties that prevent them from obtaining in-person care. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, telehealth has transformed uh, into a, a vital uh, public health measure. Uh, the COVID-19 virus didn't magically erase the existing endemic health issues, and it certainly exacerbated many. Uh, patients with chronic conditions still need their prescriptions. They still need their continuing care. Mental and, mental and behavioral health issues still need attention and be, might even be magnified by increased isolation. Um, Anytime preventative healthcare services are not accessible or utilized, the system is forced to respond to emergencies, progressive disease states, and uh, the skyrocketing costs that are related to that. So in this context, telehealth is a tool to promote both physical distancing to prevent the spread of COVID-19 while enabling healthcare to patients that need it. Despite the benefits, there are also challenges. Telehealth cannot substitute for many physical exams uh, and a lot of special equipment simply cannot be used in telehealth account encounters. Um, with telehealth, there also comes new technology and security issues. We also know that there are a number of barriers that impede telehealth for both patients and providers. Uh, for instance, they might not have access to technology needed to support the telehealth encounter. Uh, both patients and providers sometimes struggle with digital literacy, which is a huge issue. There are, um, and often, as we'll, we'll talk about much later, uh, there isn't always reliable internet coverage, especially in, in rural areas. With that very, very brief background, this presentation is all about governments rapidly responding to a developing emergency by changing their laws. 
And this really dovetails into our first recommendation. Governments should ensure that legal authorities are clear to healthcare providers and the public. Anytime there's uncertainty in new emergency uh, authorities, uh, that creates doubt for healthcare providers and might make them more reluctant to begin offering new telehealth services or telehealth in new ways. Uh, remember, we're talking about cash trap organizations making decisions about investing time and resources in new technology and new workflows. Clarity is critical. There are three major pieces of federal legislation that relate to telehealth in response to COVID-19. The most significant of these is the CARES Act, which we will touch on uh, in more detail later. This is a broad overview of state actions uh, implementing uh, and promoting telehealth. Uh, here you see as of May 18th, 2020, 27 states implemented new authorities relating to telehealth in response to COVID-19. These include new uh, legislation, uh, new emergency regulations, and executive actions. There are a number of different ways that we see governments uh, promoting telehealth through law. I'll introduce them here and we'll come back to them in turn later on. First, uh, governments can change the rules about how telehealth is delivered. Uh, this is primarily uh, done with the states, although the federal government has a big role in uh, how uh, federal government, uh, how federal programs um, implement requirements. Um, states uh, have substantial control over licensure laws and defining how health professionals uh, can use telehealth. States and the federal government can modify laws uh, surrounding payment and reimbursement of telehealth services. Uh, new laws can provide uh, appropriations and other mechanisms to promote and enhance telehealth infrastructure and capacity. And uh, finally, governments can pass laws that directly address the barriers disparities and equity issues surrounding telehealth. Uh, this last group is where we will start our substantive uh, recommendations. We know that there are telehealth disparities among certain populations, elderly individuals, persons of color, and persons with low socioeconomic status all tend to have a harder time uh, utilizing telehealth as compared to other populations. Now, for those of you that have been paying attention to COVID-19 news and research, these populations should have immediately triggered a red flag because these are many of the same populations that are at the highest risk of COVID-19. This should be alarming. Um, we would hope that these at-risk populations would benefit the most from expanded telehealth services. But if they are more likely to experience these barriers or challenges to telehealth, then health problems and disparities within those at-risk populations could be exacerbated terribly. And unfortunately, that is exactly what seems to be occurring now. Um, Here's some data published by Nuri et al. Uh, which shows the proportions of population using telehealth before COVID in blue and the proportions of the populations uh, utilizing telehealth after the big uh, COVID-19 telehealth expansion in orange. And what we see here is that the proportions of many of these populations have dropped significantly. Uh, this suggests that these populations uh, at the highest risk are not experiencing the same benefit as uh, lower risk populations. Uh, governments should address uh, major telehealth barriers to address these widening inequities. One of the major barriers is digital literacy. Uh, 
We recommend that Congress pass a law permitting Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement for patient training and education to improve telehealth digital literacy. The benefit of this would be twofold. It would directly address a major telehealth barrier and associated disparities. And second, it would normalize a cost-effective service. Moving on to telehealth delivery. Laws define which technologies and communication methods qualify as a telehealth service for both practice and reimbursement for the service. Laws also place restrictions on the practice of telehealth, such as location requirements for patients and providers. The federal government has taken steps to expand the permitted telehealth delivery options. And so here are a few examples. Medicare and TRICARE programs have approved audio only telehealth for limited services during the COVID-19 response. Uh, additionally, on, on March 20th, 2020, the Office of Civil Rights uh, uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services announced that it was not going to enforce um, HIPAA violations uh, against providers using telehealth in good faith during the emergency. And the goal was to alleviate uh, provider concerns of privacy and security violations and the associated hefty fines when they are using widely available communication platforms like Zoom or Skype or FaceTime. Here we see the states that have new laws providing for new modes of telehealth delivery. Uh, I want to note that the audio only um, and the text and email uh, communications were fairly rare forms of telehealth prior to COVID-19. However, um, adding these as acceptable forms of telehealth uh, helps to address some of the technology access challenges that are common to, uh, for many telehealth patients and providers. Since technology access is, a, is such a significant barrier to telehealth utilization, we recommend that state governors utilize their emergency powers to permit uh, additional modes of telehealth in the COVID-19 response. These might be less than ideal, uh, but if the alternatives are to neglect needed healthcare or to risk exposure to a deadly disease, um, some compromise on new modes uh, is reasonable. Both the states and the federal government have acted to expand uh, permitted locations for telehealth encounters. Uh, CMS expanded access to telehealth services covered by temporarily lifting the previously restrictive uh, location requirements and permitting Medicare beneficiaries to receive telehealth in any location, including homes. Uh, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs promulgated a new regulation uh, permitting home visits to occur via telehealth, um, and a handful of states have added new authorities expanding permitted telehealth locations for both providers and uh, patients. Our recommendation is that governments permit both providers and patients to use telehealth from a safe location, uh, which includes their home, um, provided that the service can be provided to the requisite standard of care. Uh, this recommendation includes um, federal program requirements like Medicare as well. State licensure laws can be a powerful um, legal lever to promote telehealth. We could talk about some length uh, about this, but frankly, don't have the time in this presentation. But there are two types of licensure laws that are particularly relevant. Um, one being scope of practice regulations for physicians and non-physician providers and interjurisdictional practice laws. What you see here um, are the states that have new COVID-19 telehealth authorities that permit new providers to use telehealth services. These include uh, non-physicians like nurse practitioners, uh, specialists, uh, mental behavioral health care providers, 
occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech language pathologists. Um, but I'd like to highlight uh, what's in the, um, the far right hand column. Uh, we see a number of states that have broadly authorized telehealth providers to practice telehealth within the scope of their professional, professional license. This relates to our next recommendation. Um, I, I'd make a, a, an argument, I'd call it a strong argument, that states should permit any telehealth services that can meet the same standard of care as a comparable in-person service. Now, the corollary to this is that states in the federal government should require uh, public and private payers to cover uh, telehealth services that can be provided to the requisite standard of care if um, the comparable in-person service is also, also covered. The next recommendation is limited to the COVID-19 response where in-person visits pose additional risk for providers and patients uh, as in exposure to, to COVID-19 uh, and delaying care exacerbates health issues. Uh, states should consider permitting telehealth services where providers can meet an acceptable level of care. In determining what an acceptable level of care is, policymakers uh, we think should consider the risk of harm from a comparable in-person visit, exposure to COVID-19, for example, and the risk of harm from delaying the service until after the COVID-19 emergency. Laws regulating Medicare, Medicaid, and private health plans, they establish rules and requirements for paying telehealth services, fundamentally shaping uh, service delivery. Restrictive telehealth payment laws are often cited as a barrier to telehealth adoption. For example, laws imposing out-of-pocket expenses on teleservices uh, can act as a barrier to uh, telehealth utilization. The CARES Act uh, introduced uh, new regulatory flexibility for federal health plans like Medicare, as well as certain private health plans, uh, including the high deductible health plans uh, regulated by the ACA. Um, CMS acted to authorize telehealth uh, by new providers, occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech language pathologists. Um, there are also a number of actions waiving cost sharing and co-payments, including uh, Medicare, TRICARE, and COVID-related uh, services covered by private health plans. Uh, here you see the states that have enacted uh, laws expanding coverage of telehealth services by Medicaid, private insurance, as well as workers' compensation programs. You'll notice that uh, quite a bit of the, um, the, the, the changes in law relate to um, private insurance. comprising the dark green, the light green, and the light orange um, states. All include private insurance. We've also seen a handful of states that have enacted laws that limit uh, out-of-pocket expenses um, paid for by patients uh, utilizing those telehealth services uh, for both uh, private insurance and Medicaid. We recommend that uh, states and the federal government uh, expand telehealth uh, coverage um, provided by both public and private health plans. We would also recommend that uh, state and federal governments reduce and or eliminate these co-payments and other out-of-pocket expenses for appropriate telehealth services during the COVID-19 response. And also to permanently reduce uh, and or eliminate out-of-pocket expenses for uh, 
telehealth services that have demonstrated cost savings. Um, these recommendations have three purposes. Uh, one, we should encourage telehealth use by patients to promote physical distancing while caring for existing problems. Two, uh, eliminating copay requirements uh, removes a significant barrier for new telehealth providers, providers um, because they would otherwise be forced to create new workflows and processes for virtual payments. And three, uh, lowering copays incentivizes the use of telehealth and may accelerate the normalization of telehealth as a cost effective service. Uh, the next legal lever, which I will only touch upon briefly, um, relates to infrastructure capacity for telehealth. This includes funding for internet coverage uh, and access and laws providing funding for promoting telehealth capabilities and technology adoption. Um, this is where the bulk of the action was uh, in the Federal CARES Act. Um, now you see some big amounts here. Not all these funds were dedicated entirely to telehealth. Uh, but promoting telehealth was one of the express aims of the, many of these funds. Uh, I want to close this presentation as I've opened it uh, with recommendations uh, and a note on equity. Clearly, there are disparities with telehealth. Clearly, there are early data suggesting that these disparities and inequities among those at-risk populations are only getting worse during the present pandemic. The federal government and state governments have changed laws very, very rapidly to expand telehealth on a national scale. It is critically important that the impacts of these policy changes are carefully monitored to ensure that unintended consequences are identified and addressed as quickly as possible, particularly as they relate and negatively affect those vulnerable populations. Uh, this work could not have been done with some of my co-authors and, and uh, fellow researchers, um, so I think it is important that they be acknowledged. Um, at this point in time, I would uh, be delighted to answer any questions that you might have. Um, welcome any email comments or questions. Uh, my work email is here. Uh, there are a number of findings and recommendations uh, that are included in the published report, but were cut for time. So please feel free to, to take a look uh, there for, for more information as well. Let me see if I can find the uh, open window with those questions. Um, so I don't see any just yet. The one thing I, I, I will note is, is many of you may have been a little bit surprised, especially if you've uh, done a lot of work in uh, telehealth, that I didn't have a, uh, a slide directly addressing one of the biggest issues in uh, telehealth law and policy, which is parity. Um, and there are very good arguments for and against um, parity laws. Parity, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, essentially means that um, the law requires uh, reimbursement or payment for a telehealth service at the same level as a comparable in-person service. And one of the uh, motivating or one of the primary reasons for having a, a parity law is to encourage providers through the added in, uh, uh, reimbursement uh, to offer telehealth services. Um, and and this, is, this is wonderful. Um, it, you know, it ideally would incentivize more providers to provide it. The downside with uh, a parity uh, law is that telehealth as a cost savings surf, uh, service, um, if you are artificially inflating the, the, the cost or the reimbursement of that service, then you're neutralizing that benefit of it as a service. Now, in the context of COVID-19, where there are many, many healthcare providers that are fi struggling financially as uh, with uh, decreasing patient volumes, we think that there is a, a very good argument for uh, having uh, 
uh, at least temporary parity authorities uh, to, to help with some of those falling patient volumes. Hi, Kaysen. Um, I do have a question coming in through my chat if you're oh. not able to see it, and I'll I go ahead and read that. No problem. Um, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, it seems there are not a lot of states passing policies to allow more flexibilities for telehealth. What are some of the barriers or challenges to passing these types of policies? Um, so we did see quite a few, at least executive actions, uh, waiving some requirements for, um, for telehealth uh, in, in, in you know, over 20 states. Um, but in terms of creating permanent policy changes, there are, you're absolutely correct, there are substantial barriers to the policymaking process. Um, you have to, you know, competing interests from uh, provider interest groups, um, from technology companies. There are economic concerns. There are patient concerns. Um, and, and it's a new technology. And to some extent, there is a lot of evident or a lot of things that we just don't know a whole lot about. And so, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult to make decisions as a technology is, is rapidly uh, uh, changing. I'd also uh, say that, you know, there's something to be said about, you know, windows of opportunity to create new policy. Um, we, we often think that, you know, the, the window for, for opportunity to implement a new policy uh, is sometimes open, sometimes it's closed, sometimes it's, it's opening up. And uh, when it snaps shut, it just snaps shut. And there are a lot of things that have to align to get through a lot of those, um, uh, to get to the finish line. Um, and so I, I think their their point I'm trying to make is that there are a lot of different factors that, that, that might be getting in the way to implementing a lot of these changes. Um, hopefully that answered your question. I do see, uh, please feel free to follow up if, if I completely dodged it. Uh, but I'm an attorney, I'm supposed to do stuff like that. Um, I do see one additional question in the chat. What are the significant privacy issues we should be concerned about with telehealth? Um, I, I would slightly rephrase that issue. Um, you know, privacy, uh, you know, as a concept, you know, deals with those, uh, those uh, rules about use and disclosure of information. Um, the, I think the, the primary concept we're talking about here is, is one of uh, confidentiality and security. Um, and ensuring that we have the adequate technology to secure the transmissions of data um, and preventing people who may want to access that information for nefarious purposes or uh, uh, reduce the, the, the chances that that information is going to go somewhere where it shouldn't go. Um, I, I, I would say it's, it's prob probably more of a technological uh, security issue rather than um, one of, of privacy. Now, in the context of COVID-19, where you have states and the federal government uh, implementing uh, new authorities to allow different modes of telehealth communications. Um, so, for instance, those the states that are permitting in the federal government, which is, is, is sort of relaxing its discretion on things like Zoom or Google Hangouts um, as a mode to... Um, to, to, to do, use telehealth, um, you know, that's uh, uh, clearly, you know, the privacy and security of those, uh, of those platforms is, is, is a concern. How to ensure telehealth access for Medicaid uh, is, an, is a question I see in the chat. Uh, it's a great question. You know, Medicaid is a uh, it's a program that is uh, run by the federal government. Uh, well, it's run by the states under the rules prescribed by the federal government. So there's there's a bit of a partnership there, um, and so the states have some uh, flexibility, quite a bit of flexibility actually, uh, 
to um, uh, implement rules relating to Medicaid administration that in fact promote uh, telehealth access. Uh, some of those rules can uh, include uh, relaxing location requirements, allowing patients to have telehealth in their homes. Um, they can include uh, rules permitting certain healthcare providers, such as nurse practitioners or mental and behavioral health therapists, um, from uh, to access uh, or to provide telehealth services. <coughs> There's a lot of a lot of different ways that that can happen. I think we're at time, Kason. Wonderful, because I can no longer speak. Thank you very <laughs> much. I, I appreciate it. Thanks, Kason. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to have you with us here today. Um, my name is Betsy Lawton, and I am a senior staff attorney with the Network for Public Health Law in the Northern Region, which is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit um, to talk about how broadband access itself impacts public health, what disparities in access mean during the COVID pandemic, and uh, opportunities to reduce the digital divide. Now I need to figure out how to scare, share my screen. And I think I've got it there, okay. Um, so this first slide is just a disclaimer. It talks a little bit about the Network for Public Health Law and um, includes a disclaimer that this presentation should not be considered legal advice. So first I wanna to touch on, um, um, take a minute just to capture the relationship between broadband access and public health. Uh, the FCC has a pretty good quote here from 2015. They noted that broadband is essential to participate in society. Households that lack internet access are at an increasing disadvantage as institutions and schools and even government agencies require internet access to meaningfully participate in society. But why are we worried about access to broadband as a public health concern? Well, it's because broadband access significantly impacts all of the social determinants of health. And without broadband equity, we can't achieve health equity. So those of you, for those of you that may not be familiar with the social determinants of health, these are the conditions and the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, and play. And they affect a wide range of health outcomes and risks. So for example, without broadband access, educational opportunities are diminished. Children may not be able to complete their homework. They have higher learning loss during the summer. And now during the pandemic, they may not even have access to their classrooms. A lack of broadband can also affect economic stability. It limits job seekers' ability to find and apply for jobs. Without broadband service, households may, as you just have heard, lack access to healthcare, mental health services, and addiction services that are increasingly going online. And broad, the lack of broadband service also can really limit access to many social supports and opportunities for civic participation that have moved online. So if, Thinking about the current situation, many individuals are not going to want to go to the to vote in person for fear of COVID-19 in a, in a group setting. And so many individuals are using the internet to order absentee ballots. Without the internet, that is a more difficult process. So unlike other essential infrastructure, broadband service is largely provided by private companies without significant federal oversight over prices or infrastructure development. And there are two main reasons that households may lack, lack broadband service. The first is access. That means the technology or the infrastructure isn't available in certain areas. Uh, there are digital deserts in rural and urban areas where broadband service providers don't see an economic benefit in providing that service. The other major barrier is affordability. And this potentially is a larger barrier for many communities. It can be particularly difficult in areas where there's only one service provider and prices are high. At an average cost of $60 a month, broadband subscriptions are increasingly out of reach for lower income communities. And there are federal programs that provide funding to increase deployment throughout uh, the United States of broadband infrastructure. And states and localities are also stepping in to help address the digital divide. 
So for example, many states have adopted statewide adoption goals. I know Minnesota has and many other states have. Uh, it's helpful to have a deadline on those adoption goals because that, that can keep the process moving. Um, there are statewide networks being provided like that in North Dakota. And states are looking at public-private partnerships to help serve underserved areas. And then local governments have also stepped in to fill the gaps in broadband coverage by operating their own community-owned broadband networks. Um, these can be owned by a municipality, a tribe, or a rural electric or telephone cooperative, or a public-private partnership. And right now there are well over 300 of these municipal or community broadband networks in the US, but there is some, um, they're not always embraced by the communities in about 20 states. Um, this map here in the lower left hand corner or right hand corner of the slide depicts those states that have um, limited restricted community broadband services via law. So this is by altogether banning the establishment of community broadband via preemptive laws or placing serious restrictions on development of those programs. There have been several attempts um, in Congress to specifically bar states from doing this. Um, and it would be essentially federal government preempting state preemption. Um, but to date, none of those proposed bills have been adopted by Congress. So how big is this digital divide? Um, by some estimates, it's upward of 40 million individuals cannot access home broadband service. FCC's estimates are a little lower due to its data collection practices, but even FCC's data shows that over 20% of individuals living in rural areas and tribal lands just lack the infrastructure to access broadband. And nearly 50% of individuals living on rural tribal lands lack the broadband infrastructure necessary for accessing the internet. FCC's data also shows fairly high numbers of households in the US have not adopted fixed broadband. And this could be because of affordability issues. Um, there may be some folks who just aren't interested, um, but likely there are a lot of households that can't afford the services. So 30% of urban residents don't have home broadband, 40% of rural residents don't have home broadband, and more than 50% of residents of tribal lands have not adopted home broadband. And this is all according to a study that the FCC um, issued earlier this year. And there are also significant disparities in adoption rates for um, broadband access. So uh, black neighborhoods have much lower home adoption rates than white neighborhoods and tribal communities fall far behind in accessibility. So for 32% of residents in tribal lands, there's no broadband service provider and, only, and another 36% only have access to one broadband provider. Um, these disparities contribute to large educational disparities as well. Uh, over 30% of black, black, Latinx, and Native American households with school-aged children lack home broadband. Even pre-pandemic, 21% of black students had to use, rely on public Wi-Fi to complete homework. And you can't find as much public Wi-Fi anymore now that we're dealing with the, um, the pandemic. So eliminating the digital divide is particularly important to prevent an expansion of educational disparities for kids that don't have access to broadband, access at homework and are, are at home and are at risk of um, falling farther behind in school. So the COVID-19 pandemic has heightened the need for internet connectedness. connectedness. I mean, here we are having an online summit that last year we may have had in person um, so, you know, that's just evidence that we are increasingly relying on broadband service, um, services. Um, also, employment and educational opportunities have moved online. Individuals are increasingly relying on telehealth, as Kaysen mentioned. And at the same time, opportunities to use that pu those public Wi-Fi points of access have diminished because schools and libraries have shuttered. And you know, some people relied on coffee shops to access the internet. Those aren't as easy to get into these days. And as the economic fallout of the pandemic um, leaves many households unable to afford to pay for service. And this is a serious community um, concern among a lot of low income communities. So what types of policies and legal responses are we seeing to address broadband needs during the pandemic? 
The federal government has provided significant funding to improve access to broadband services um, via the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act that Kasey mentioned earlier. This includes fund several funding streams meant to expand rural broadband deployment and to assist schools and libraries during closures. That's about $16 billion um, to purchase technology and connectivity to support remote learning, another 200 million to expand telehealth access, and then 50 million to, in to the Institute for Museum and Library Services to expand their digital network access. But without policy changes, this funding alone isn't likely to remedy the public health disparities that arise from the digital divide. So the FCC's early efforts to address broadband access during the pandemic was one of its early efforts was called the Keep America Connected Pledge, which is a vol voluntary commitment. FCC asked broadband service providers to voluntarily commit to waiving its late fees, not terminating service for folks that can't pay, and opening Wi-Fi hotspots to individuals that need them. But these voluntary commitments have expired, they expired in June. And Chairman Pai, who's the current FCC chairman, has urged congressional action to ensure that individuals can remain connected throughout this sort of lengthening pandemic response. FCC has also made some short-term revisions to its universal service fund programs. These USF programs are their longstanding programs that um, utilize revenue from the telecommunication companies rather than congressional appropriations to reduce the economic burden of broadband services. So for example, the FCC has waived um, some of its restrictions that are normally apply to its E-rate program. The E-rate program provides discounts on broadband services directly to schools and libraries. Um, and the FCC has temporarily waived its gift rules that would prevent E-rate recipients from accepting free connections or equipment such as Hi-Fi wi hi wi wi hotspots to, re to support remote learning. Um, and this, this um, waiver temporarily allows broadband service providers to provide free mobile hotspots and broadband, broadband enabled devices directly to schools and libraries. And then those devices and hotspots can be distributed to students um, that lack home broadband access. However, FCC has not authorized the use of these E-rate funds to provide broadband service directly to students' homes. And that could have a sign significant um, ability to reduce educational um, disparities if those funds could be used to provide home broadband service. Um, some children can access their classroom from their living rooms. Other kids can't and they're left to walk or drive or take the bus to libraries or sit outside their school in the parking lot to access their classrooms. But there is disagreement about whether federal law authorizes these E-rate particular funds to be used to provide broadband outside um, classroom buildings. The current chairman, Chairman Pai, believes that additional statutory authority is needed to do so, but others believe the statutory authority already exists. I mean, regardless, congressional clarification could ensure that those funds are used to provide broadband to students' homes, which are now oftentimes their classrooms as well. FCC has also made some temporary changes to ease application requirements for households that are newly eligible for its Lifeline program. This is a program that provides a monthly discount on either cell phone services or broadband, broadband services. It's not, a, it's not a large discount. It's only $9.25 a month. There is an additional $25 monthly discount provided for rural residents of tribal lands. But the FCC has made it easier for individuals who have recently lost their jobs to apply for these services and um, has prevented de-enrollment. And then the FCC has waived, waived similar gift, gift rules for the Healthcare Connect Fund, um, which provides discounts on broadband con connectivity for rural healthcare providers. And then lastly, the FCC is working to distribute about $100 million under its new Connected Care Pilot Program, and that's used to support telehealth at public and nonprofit healthcare institutions. This funding, unlike the E-rate funding, which I just mentioned, can be used to pay for home broadband connections for patients that otherwise lack service. Moving on to local solutions. Local efforts have proven really powerful here in um, addressing educational disparities, disparities tied to the digital divide and pandemic-related closures. 
Uh, among other things, communities dealing with school closures have paid for broadband service at homes. They've outfitted school buses with Wi-Fi hotspots and parked those Wi-Fi enabled buses in uh, low income neighborhoods or underserved neighborhoods when they're not in use. And they're partnering with broadband providers to provide low cost or free services to households. But are these policies enough and will they close the digital divide? Likely not for the short, short term and definitely not for the long term after the temporary programs expire. So there are several federal, state and local policies that we uh, that could help equitably close the digital divide, both during the pandemic and in the future. So on the federal level, uh, Congress could and should pass legislation barring states from preempting or restricting local public broadband services. Those services are being used to fill gaps and they need to be available for communities. FCC could allow E-rate funds to pay for home broadband at students' homes. Those homes are now their classrooms um, and they need access to their classrooms. FCC could, see, could also increase that li lifeline discount. Instead of $9.25, they could increase that discount so that low-income families are paying around $10 a month is what might, um, might be reasonable for widespread adoption there. Um, FCC should improve its data on affordability and availability and demographics and base its future funding um, decisions on this new data rather than its antiquated data that it currently has. And Congress and FCC should increase funding to schools and community centers to expand their access. So steps can, uh, states can also be uh, taking action here. Um, they can eliminate those preemption laws that are preventing local communities from filling the gaps in broadband service. Uh, they can enact dig law, dig once laws. And these laws require coordination of broadband installation with other infrastructure projects, um, which can increase um, deployment as other infrastructure is being um, ad adopted in the community. And then states can, as I mentioned, set statewide connectivity goals with certain deadlines um, would be the helpful way to do that. And localities can take quite a bit of action as well here to address the digital divide. Uh, they can increase the mobile hotspots provided by cities can do this, counties can do this, schools um, can provide these, and at community anchor institutions. And this idea that buses can be equipped with hotspots um, can be parked in neighbor underserved neighborhoods when not in use can fill some of those gaps in home broadband service as long as those Wi-Fi hotspots provide sufficient internet connectivity to those communities. Localities can offer a free citywide wireless. Then local go governments can also promote competition and fill gaps um, by providing the community broadband services. Or they can promote those services being provided by rural elect electric um, utilities or cooperatives. Um, and a lot of localities are looking to public-private partnerships to support broadband co connectivity. I think Chicago just made a commitment to provide free internet service to about 100,000 school children in the community um, for the next two years. And they did use some of that federal funding that we talked about earlier from the CARES Act to do so. And uh, localities can also establish community-wide connectivity goals. So that can happen on all levels of government here. Um, you know, if anything, the COVID pandemic has illuminated the inequities uh, facing households without broadband, and it's highlighted the need to prepare for the future by ensuring that uh, home broadband is available to all individuals so that everyone can participate in education, healthcare, the job market, and society. You know, with that, I just wanted to note that for those of you that may be interested in learning more, the network uh, recently presented a webinar on broadband access issues, and that webinar addresses um, policy opportunities for rural areas, Native American communities, and goes into a little bit more detail on the, um, on the allowance of municipal broadband networks and the barriers to um, getting those networks up and running that are exist in, in many states. A link for that webinar can be found here at the bottom of this of this screen here. You know, and with that, I'm I'm happy to open it up to, to questions. I'll take a look here uh, at the chat box to see if there are any questions coming in. Otherwise, I can uh, go ahead and um, 
talk about some issues that I've heard in other webinars that I've presented on on broadband and may help to fill in some questions that aren't being that um, you may have. So let's see here. Are there any legislative actions directed towards providing access to people experiencing homelessness? You know, I am not certain about what those specifically may be. I don't know that there's any federal actions. States may be doing something. And I think most likely it would be on a citywide level that that's happening or via community anchor institutions where um, those institutions could provide Wi-Fi hotspots um, needed um, either at shelters or elsewhere. Uh, again, the issue is how to access the internet if you don't have a computer. So those would have to be paired with both the devices and potentially some educational resources on how to um, adequately, you know, access the educational um, needs and the telehealth needs that that the individual um, is hoping to meet with their broadband service. Um, and our, this here's another question here. Are there currently providing free public Wi-Fi hotspots? Are cities currently providing free public Wi-Fi hotspots? I know uh, in Minneapolis, where I live, they are, um, and they have maps, but you have to get online to find the maps um, <laughs> unless you go to a government building. Um, and they, or you know, they may be hopefully distributing better information now than they were before. Um, but there are, they have locations identified on maps where you can go and access free Wi-Fi hotspots. And um, the libraries are often providing um, Wi-Fi connectivity, even if they're not open. So you could stand outside the library on the sidewalk or in the parking lot if there's a parking lot and use that Wi-Fi to access the internet for whatever reason you would need, if that would be for school or for a telehealth visit or whatnot. So I'm looking at the time here and see if there's room for any more questions. Looks like we do have a little more time. Um, so I maybe just wanna to touch a little bit more on um, on what's happening with those um, local broadband networks and some of the federal um, some of the federal programs um, and what's happening with um, the federal capacity to get the data they need to deploy uh, broadband access throughout throughout the nation. So um, the FCC estimates, as I mentioned earlier, are significantly lower as far as the number of people in the United States that lack broadband access. Uh, that's because they've been using a form that um, essentially indicates that if one person in a census block has access, then everyone in the census block has access, which is not necessarily the case. And so earlier this year, um, congressional action was taken to sort of improve the granularity of this data. It was called the Broadband Deployment Report and Broadband Data Act. Um, and this um, requires more granular data and allows more public participation in the process. Um, if there is, you know, these maps now and this data now can be challenged by individuals who know that they, <laughs> they don't have access to the internet in their communities. Um, you know, SDC's current data, um, even though it does show quite, quite significant disparities in communities, FCC has concluded um, in this most recent report that there is deployment, enough deployment throughout the United States. So many folks are asking that um, the next set of funding opportunities to expand deployment of in infrastructure isn't completed until these new maps with more granular data are created and adopted and public has input on that um, so that we're not using, you know, federal resources for deployment on these maps that are just too vague and don't really accurately assess the needs of communities. Um, also, maybe I'll just take a minute here to expand a little bit more on the barriers that some of those local governments that are trying to create these municipal community or community network um, networks are, are facing. 
So there are opponents of community networks. They, um, the opponents of community broadband services argue that the services are un un constitute unfair competition, that they can create taxpayer risk for the communities, and they divert funds from other resources, um, and they discourage private investment, sector investment. So, so those are some of the arguments that people may see in their states against allowing um, community broadband networks. Um, you know, in 2016, FCC actually tried to step in and block states from preempting local community networks uh, via an order, but that order was challenged in federal court in the Sixth Circuit, and um, the, the court found that federal law doesn't specifically authorize federal preemption of these state restrictions and that states do have the authority to set boundaries on telecommunications policy for local governments. But as I mentioned, there have been several efforts through the years to um, sort of preempt the preemption um, on the federal level. And I'm imagining that there are going to be, if there aren't already in this session, um, bills um, trying to do that as well. Let's see if there's any other questions coming in here. Well, it looks like there's a comment that there, um, in the comment chat box, if you're interested in finding about, out about free Wi-Fi hotspots in Texas, um, there is a link that has been included in the chat box there. Um, use your Wi-Fi to print a map um, for those who don't have access to the, to the broadband services. Um, Hey, Betsy, this is Kayleen. Um, I had a, a question come in my chat. Oh. Um, they asked if broadband is likely to become a public utility. So I think at this point, it is not. Um, so there uh, in, I don't know if it was 2015, maybe, the federal government um, made a move to um, label broadband as um, a comp under Title II of the Communications Act, which would make it a common carrier, which would require a lot more oversight from the federal government and abilities to um, regulate both access and service and things along those lines. Um, that was upheld by the court. Um, but then in 2017, the federal government shifted back um, to sort of this lighter regulatory mode where FCC doesn't really have its broadband's not considered anymore a common carrier and there's less regulatory authority over broadband service providers you know the majority of federal oversight right now is in funding or you know providing access via these um, uss usf programs universal service um, programs um, so i i guess i'm i'm not seeing that right now would be a really strong time, even though there is um, a lot of literature out there that certainly says it's it's time um, to start treating broadband as essential infrastructure and a utility. Let's see, I'm trying to see the time here. Um, okay. There's another question that came in about, uh, do you think having broadband may become a condition of employment? Well, certainly uh, right now, it's a condition of me being able to work at home uh, if I didn't have broadband. Um, and it's been going out a lot lately. Um, you know, I can't work. Um, and so it is in some ways been made by default a condition of continued employment in some settings that may not be able to provide broadband access at any other space um, where employees could use it. Um, I don't know that it would ever become a mandated condition of employment uh, if certainly unless there is guaranteed equitable service. Um, it seems like it would be pretty hard to say that um, you can't have employment because you don't have home broadband if we're not going to treat it like infrastructure, essential infrastructure. Not sure. Uh, those are sort of the end of the questions that I see. And, you know, we're getting near to the end. If there's any other questions, go ahead and um, put them in the chat box, either for Kason or, or myself. Otherwise, 
We might be able to wrap up a few minutes early here. Well, I'd like to thank both of you for an excellent session um, and encourage our attendees to um, tell us what you thought of today's session by clicking on the survey button um, below the video feed. I wanna thank you all for attending the summit and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.